Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. In Rome, there was a much publicized release of a booklet purporting to be an official response to the questions surrounding Amoris Laetitia. Then things got strange. The author and Vatican chief for interpreting legal texts failed to show up at his own press conference. Those in attendance were told the book was not an official response to the dubia. So why are we still waiting for a definitive clarification on this papal teaching on marriage uh, and divorced and remarried Catholics and communion? Here to help us process all of this and more, we are joined on set by the papal posse. Joining me is editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, and via satellite from Manhattan is Father Gerald Murray, canon lawyer and pastor extraordinaire. Father, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you both for being here. Let's start with this controversial, it was billed as a book, it's really not a book, it's 51 pages, uh, a snappy title in typical Vatican style titled The Eighth Chapter of the Post-Synodal Apostolic Exhortation by the aforementioned Cardinal Francesco Coco Palmerio. In it, he states the following. This is the cardinal. The divorced and remarried de facto couples, those cohabitating, are certainly not models of unions in sync with Catholic doctrine, but the Church cannot look the other way. Therefore, the sacraments of reconciliation and of communion must be given even to those so-called wounded families and to however many who, despite living in situations not in line with traditional matrimonial canons, express the sincere desire to approach the sacraments after an appropriate period of discernment. Father Murray, what is this in your estimation? And are good intentions enough to receive Holy Communion in the Catholic Church? Uh, this is really a disaster, I'll say it straight out. It's a direct contradiction of what the church has always taught, is what John Paul II, now St. John Paul, taught in Familiars Consortio and in subsequent documents. The idea that you would say people who are living in an adulterous union are not exactly models of Catholic uh, marriage, but nonetheless they should be given communion. Mm. This is casting aside the message of the gospel. Holy communion is the bread of life given to those who approach the altar in the proper disposition, which means if you're committing mortal sin, you go to confession. If you're planning on committing mortal sin in the days ahead, then you can't go to confession because you can't repent. So it's a, there are a lot of slogans, a lot of euphemisms. Mm. Holy communion should not be received by people who are objectively contradicting the truth of Christ. I think the Cardinals made a tremendous mistake here, and I regret it. Uh, Bob, let's talk for a moment about what's happening in the backdrop. This was billed, this was sold as kind of the answer, the official answer to that famous dubia that Cardinal Burke and those three other cardinals put forward. A dubia is nothing more than a series of questions. Yes or no answers are all that are required to clarify. Can Catholics who are divorced and remarried without an annulment get communion? It's a simple question. Uh, at the last minute, the Cardinal Coco Palmero, who was supposed to show up and answer all the questions, bailed on the press conference. And then Father Costa, who's a member of the Holy See Press Office, says this is not an official Vatican response, but it is authoritative, and we are part of the dialogue. What is this? Well, it's hard to say, of course, but I, if I had to guess, this seems to me to be part and parcel of something we've talked about before and lots of other people have discussed, and that mm -hmm. is that the Holy Father has this set of principles that he likes to operate by. He used the same principles when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, and right. one of them is that the Church doesn't have to, as he says, dominate spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, has, it, it allows time to develop and questions and discussion to take place, which is fine if you're the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. The problem here, and I, I think that the backing off indicated some personal ner nervousness on the part mm -hmm. of Coco Palmerio. But also, I think, the, what we've seen since the beginning with, with Amoris Laetitia, that there is an, a reluctance, actually, to take the stand. Mm. And so there's, you know, this is just another voice, and we've got other cardinals, of course, as Father Murray says today at the Catholic thing, if I may put in a plug yeah, for, yes. for his wonderful article this morning. Um, we have, again, yet again, the highest levels, except for the very highest level, 
saying contradictory things that also may, as the as Father said, contradict the entire tradition of the Church. The mm -hmm. only way that this can be resolved is for the Holy Father himself to step forward. I've, mm -hmm. I've said this before. After Humanae Vitae, when Paul VI took a right. very unpopular position about contraception, mm -hmm. affirming the, the, the teaching, there was controversy all over the place, but there was no doubt about what he said. Mm. Now all we have is a dialogue that's going on. So we don't have either a, a, a fidelity to Catholic teaching or a definite change in discipline. Mm. Father Murray, uh, Cardinal Coco Palmero had this to say about um, as an example, and he raised this example to justify and undergird his interpretation of Amoris Laetitia. He said, a woman who's been married for 10 years to a man who had been abandoned by his first wife and left with three small children are in this situation, and then he says this, the woman has full awareness of being in an irregular situation. She sincerely wants to change her life, but clearly she cannot. If, in fact, she left the union, the children would be without a mother. Therefore, the union would mean not fulfilling a moral duty towards innocent persons. Do you buy that argument? I don't buy it at all. Number one, those children already have a mother. The mother is the wife of her second husband, of her husband, so to speak. She's the second wife. She was acting in the place of the mother, but they have a mother, and that mother has duties to those children. Uh, secondly, uh, the Catholic Church has taught if there is a serious reason why those in an invalid second marriage must remain together for the good of the children or for other reasons taking care of a sick spouse, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, then you have to live as brother and sister. The sin is adultery. You're not allowed to commit adultery. That's quite, that's the sixth commandment. You know, one thing that really puzzles me in this whole discussion is the resistance to describing things as they are. Adultery means adultery. It's uh, irregular unions you know, you can have an uh, irregular has all kinds of meanings. We're talking <laughs> about gospel truth here. The Lord reaffirmed quite clearly the invalidity saying that you can have a second spouse. He said the man who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. We should have gospel frankness here. Uh, that's what the Pope has called for, and I agree with Bob. Uh, the only one who can solve this debate is Pope Francis, and I think, you know, as an appeal to him from a pastor in the trenches, Pastoral charity requires that he solve all of these confusing doubts because no one is, is in, in good shape when you have one cardinal criticizing another and, and the mm -hmm. priests like me having to get on TV and tell people, no, things don't change even though a cardinal says it changes. This is confusing. Yeah. Now, you heard uh, Cardinal Coco Palmerio's uh, take, um, and we were told at this press conference when his book was rolled out, I wish I could write a little book this size, uh, that it has the same reading as the bishops of Malta, Germany, Buenos Aires, but it flies in the face, it see, at least it seems to, of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith's interpretation. Cardinal Gerhard Müller had this to say about Amoris Laetitia just last week. He said, for us, marriage is an expression of participation in the unity between Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, his bride. This is not, as some said during the Synod, a simple vague analogy. No, this is the substance of the sacrament and no power in heaven or on earth, neither an angel nor the pope nor a council nor a law of the bishops has the faculty to change it. Amoris Laetitia must be interpreted in the light of the whole doctrine of the church. Now, Bob, here we are. Now, we've, been, we've been getting emails all night about this. Who is right here? Is the CDF right? Or is Cardinal Coco Palmerio and the bishops of, of, of Malta and Germany right? You know, it's interesting that at this press conference that presented this so-called answer to the dubia and then, you know, was backed off on, there was a journalist, or it's not exactly clear, but there was a journalist who stepped forward and said, well, we have to ask the question, who made up these rules and what is it? I think this is a good question to ask, actually, because mm -hmm. it's Jesus who made this rule. It was a a rule that was shocking to the, the Pharisees and, and the strict uh, Jews of his time. Mm -hmm. This is something that has always been taught by the church. We, we now have a, a, conf a conflict, not just between existing cardinals, but it's made to appear as if the people who remain faithful to the teaching are somehow themselves Pharisees, mm. the, the ones that, that Jesus was contradicting with this very teaching that they're trying to defend. Yeah. There's something very odd going on here. And I would have to say that um, 
You, we'll just, this can only get worse as time goes on, as various people take one side or the other in what has to be determined at the very highest level in the church. Well, it gives the feeling, it gives the feeling of a schism. It's not a schism, but it gives the feeling of one because people are taking sides, and it's not just any people. It, I mean, as, as Father Murray's article, uh, you know, it's, it's Cardinals Clashing is the title of the article. When Cardinals Clash, this, this is what we seem to be seeing, and it is very confusing to the people at home and the people watching all over the world, not just here in the United States or at this table. Yeah, and I'd like to add one other thing. We have to, I haven't seen the full text yet. I haven't seen the Italian text, but yeah. I'll, I'll be getting it soon. It seemed to me that in the excerpts that have been published, that they've gone beyond simply saying that the people who are divorced and remarried in these special circumstances right. where you know, there's goodwill, yeah. there's some, some problem, that they're also talking about couples that are cohabiting, it seems to be in, mm -hmm. in the language, and other irregular circumstances. Now, we've always, you go to talk to any moral theologian of, of substance, of, of credibility, and it's always been the Catholic teaching that you cannot do evil so that good will come out of it. So you can't mm -hmm. say you should continue to commit adultery yeah. so that some other good w will result. Yeah, so that, so that he or she can feel loved. Right. I mean, you can tell, people could say, uh, you know, if I kill so-and-so, this good will result from it. Well, that's true, but you're not allowed to, to murder anyone. Mm. So there's, there's some very, very strange confusion that is spreading out and out from this desire to, to regularize the irregular. Mm. It's the only way to look at it. Father Murray, there was a rather interesting, uh, Bob used the word odd earlier, declaration of uh, support this week. He was referencing odd to this whole situation, not to this particular event. Uh, the Council of Cardinals, the nine who advised Pope Francis, issued a vote of support for him this week. Uh, Cardinal, again, Francesco Coco Palmerio, who's apparently had a very active week, um, he was speaking to the Associated Press, and he said this, Cardinal Rodriguez Maradiaga, also a member of that nine cardinal panel, uh, made a declaration in the name of all of us of full support for Pope Francis and of his work. We are here to help him. He knows we love him, and we are with him. No problem with that. Now, what, what do you make of this? I've never seen anything like this, sort of a pledge of confidence. I mean, the Parliament has done this in England, but I've never seen it done at the Vatican. I wasn't so happy when I heard about it because it's adding a further political element to what we have here. As you say, this is like something that happens in a parliamentary democracy. Right now, there's a serious theological debate going on in the church about the meaning of the eighth chapter of Amoris Laetitia mm -hmm. and whether Pope Francis intends to change the teaching of the church concerning the inability mm -hmm. of people who are in adulterous relationships to worthily receive Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Burke and the other cardinals won a solution. They did a very respectful thing in bringing it forward. They're not the only ones who are wondering. And on the other hand, you have the Vatican Publishing House putting out this Coco Palmerio booklet, which never would have been published under any previous pontiff, I can guarantee that. The bishops of Malta said, if you feel you're at peace with God, go ahead and receive communion. That's not Catholic theology. Mm. That's some kind of pop psychology. That's the, the church of what's happening now. That's not the Catholic church faithful to the Lord. So, you know, it's assumed that all Catholics are loyal to the Pope. We are loyal to the Pope because he is uh, the leader of our church. But when there's a disagreement about something he says or writes, the respectful thing is not to shut your mouth and pretend there's no problem. Mm. The respectful thing is to do what Cardinal Burke did. Holy Father, mm. we are at a loss to understand what this means. Please make it clear. What do we have now? We basically got this kind of boxing match going on. One Cardinal says this, one says that, and we're supposed to, what, applaud for one side or the other? That's ridiculous. Mm. We want to know what the truth is. We want to know that the Catholic Church continues to proclaim it. And that's what we're asking the Holy Father to do. Mm. Robert Royal, I know you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, it's, it's very odd when you have a, a vote of full confidence in a pope. I don't think in the yeah, entire... Yeah, he's the pope. In I the mean, entire history he doesn't need the, that. In the entire history of the church, I don't think this has ever happened before. Yet, and I think that this is an important, maybe negative to the, the actual mm. positive, yeah. it was felt necessary. So the, there must be, even among that very close group of advisors. There must be a sense that they needed to affirm something 
because of a threat that, that seems to be from the outside. And it's not just Cardinal Burke or a few well, others. Well, pa Paul Mario referenced the posters that were all around Rome that we reported on last week with those kind of snarky lines about where's your mercy now. And then there was the uh, spoof of Lucifer Torre Romano right. that also got into some of this. Perhaps the it was the collection of those snarky critiques and they wanted to put on a public face to show, look, we're no, all with the still, Pope. You know, the, the joke is, is often that when you, in, in a parliamentary system, when you express full confidence mm -hmm. in someone, it's just the, at the point where they're about to be dismissed <laughs> from office. Thrown out of office, yeah. You know. So there, I guess there is a sense at the highest level that there, there not only is opposition, but it's serious, and that there, there's something that has to be done to kind of affirm the loyalty to the Holy Father, which I agree with, with Father. We all feel this. The problem is that he has mm -hmm. now put all of us in a situation where we're, it's impossible. We want to be loyal to, to him personally and to him as, as the head of the church, the, the successor to Peter. But what are we being loyal to and what is he telling us? I want to get to a few viewer emails and they're coming in fast and furious and on Twitter. Um, here's the first one. What is the role of the faithful in correcting clerics who support a heterodox reading of Amoris Laetitia? Father Murray. Well, the loyalty have to give witness to their adherence to the truth of the faith, and they do that by expressing in their own lives that they will never uh, take advantage of a so-called permission uh, to receive communion unworthily. They won't encourage people to do that. And they'll also make known to their pastors, uh, as provided for in canon law, make known their concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, the laity, uh, it's, all, it's interesting, clerics often talk about popular piety as being a strength in the church. It certainly is. Well, so is popular fidelity. You know, how many priests have gone off the rails since the council, you know, more than 50 years now, and the lay people stood by with their mouth agape and saying, Father, you really believe that? Mm -hmm. And they kind of like tried to knock sense into those priests who had gone off in bad directions. The laity are to give witness to the faith. Mm. I, I want to run through this other question that, that came in, and this is a fairly common one. If there is a schism, is the church automatically on the side of the pope? How do we discern which side is correct? Robert Royal. This is a very d difficult question because we've never had a circumstance where the pope obstinately teaching something that seems to be mm -hmm. contradictory to the longstanding Mm -hmm. permanent tradition of, of, of the Catholic yeah. Church. I think that we'll, we'll find ourselves sorting this out and it's going to be very, very painful. It may go on for decades. Mm -hmm. Things like this have happened in the past. But there's no, I don't think there's any automatic mechanism here or automatic principle mm. that you can apply. Wow, uncharted territory. Father Jerry, I'm going to give you the last word and the last question. Uh, Cardinal Mueller, this uh, Laura writes in, and uh, Cardinal Coco Palmero represent polar opposite interpretations of Amoris and since the Pope won't definitively answer, where does that leave us? Well, you know, I think part of the, the good thing about this ongoing debate, even though at times can be acrimonious, is that it's getting the Pope's attention. Uh, the non-response to the dubia is a mistake, in my opinion. Uh, the Pope says he's a man of dialogue and encounter. I believe him. I take him at his word. Uh, but sometimes the dialogue may not be subjects that he himself chooses. So when people mm -hmm. go to him and say, Holy Father, we don't like this confusion, this kind of mess that's come after Morris Letizia. Please solve it for us. And uh, look, the, the criteria for judgment is always the truth as proclaimed by the church from the beginning. And I'll be very clear again, I've said this on your show many times, never in the history of the church has the church said people who are living in an adulterous state and plan to continue to do so have a right to receive communion. Never been said, the reason is it can't be said. It's a direct contradiction of Christ's words. Mm. So make that point, uh, you know, yeah. however that point is made by cardinals, lay people, priests. It's all to the good because maybe the Pope will say, look, i got to pull back and say I can't go this way anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not answering. I've got to say you're right. It's a mistake to go this way. That's my prayer and hope in this matter. Okay, well, we will leave it there in prayer. Robert Royal, Father Jerry Murray, thank you for being here. You can follow all of Robert Royal and Father Murray's columns at thecatholicthing.org.